Well, it's my pleasure to be here. It really is. Thank you so much for coming here. I mean, we really owe, I, I owe you a great debt of gratitude that you've uh, taken out time from this beautiful day to come and, and listen to me talk about walking and, and cycling and to help all of us together to promote walking and cycling because it really does take, as several of our, my previous speakers uh, said, um, it really does require, it does require all of us working together. <laughs> helping each other, working with each other uh, as a coalition uh, to actually get things done. And I must say, since the past uh, five years, Vancouver has done a lot. I mean, really, you just saw those slides. Uh, I, I just, I mean, I had so much fun riding on those cycle tracks. I mean, I, I was going to say, by the way, in terms of Tanya's introduction, you can forget all the qualification, forget all that stuff. I enjoy riding a bike. <laughs> That's the only thing that's really uh, important. Well, I want to talk today about some of the things I've learned over the past five years, sort of an update of what I said five years ago. Uh, because a lot has happened, not just here in Vancouver, but all over the world. And I just want to give you a little bit of an update on that, both in terms of walking and in terms of cycling. So I did a number of studies with colleagues such as Susan Handy, Jennifer Dill, a number of other folks, uh, Mark Sinan here, looking at uh, cycling in North America, Canada, as well as the United States. And so we have a lot more information now. I mean, there must have, I'm just guessing, a thousand journal articles, many, many, many books published since I was here five years ago. So it even just gives us more information, more data, uh, more proof, really, how good walking and cycling are and why they ought to be uh, promoted. Um, I would also like to just thank uh, all of the people who, the, the organizations and the people who made this talk uh, possible. Uh, we've already sort of heard from all three of them, but you know, uh, Urban Systems, TransLink, the City of Vancouver, and of course our host here, uh, Simon Fraser University, uh, and also all of these other groups. You all really play an important role. Uh, I just can't tell you how important I want to, not sure what to call it exactly, sort of non-government organizations, uh, non-governmental organizations are in promoting walking and cycling. You're absolutely crucial. And politicians are very often just waiting to get that sort of support from other organizations who help organize the public uh, support for promoting walking and cycling. So I'm not going to name all these groups, but all these groups helped bring me here to, to Vancouver and have been really wonderful in promoting walking and cycling in the greater Vancouver area. Now, the next slide, uh, you're going to say, we know all this stuff. I know you know all that stuff. <laughs> There's so many reasons to be promoting walking and cycling and making them safer and possible for everyone, for all age groups and for all levels of physical ability. But I think one of the things we need to be able to do is to convince the public and politicians, sometimes through the media, how uh, wonderful all these benefits are of walking and cycling. You can see they have economic benefits, it's good for business, no pollution, energy efficient, healthy, fun. The point here, I'm not going to go through each of these in detail because I'm, in a sense I'm sort of speaking to the choir, but I, I think it's really important for me to make one point, and that is we need to be able to document these, and we can. I can tell you that over these past five years there have been hundreds and hundreds of studies that show all that estimate all these economic benefits of walking and cycling, both in terms of reduced health cost, in terms of benefits for businesses, in terms of job creation, in terms of when you build a cycle track, you create more jobs than when you spend the same amount of money building a roadway. So it's good for job creation, it's good for stimulating the economy, it's great for saving costs in terms of uh, health uh, expenditures and so forth. So I just want to let you know that all in every one of these cases, well, I'm not sure about the fun. <laughs> I think that's sort of obvious. Um, and also the fact that it's energy efficient. It doesn't really take anything in the way of non-renewable energy resources to, to ride a bike. Um, but in especially in terms of the economic benefits of walking and cycling and in terms of the health benefits of walking and cycling, those have been like super thorough documented down by literally hundreds of studies. And so if you want to show the public at large, the media, politicians, why it's worthwhile investing in walking and cycling, both infrastructure and programs, there really is evidence out there. Uh, but I'm not going to tell you what it is because it takes me five hours to tell you. <laughs> but I can tell you it's out there. Uh, one of the things that you've probably seen this, uh, graph, uh, this graphic before, but um, that we have much lower levels of walking and cycling than in, say, Europe 
Uh, you have, it depends on what country you're looking at, but maybe two, three times, in some cases four times as much walking and cycling in some of these European countries as we have in, say, the United States or in Canada. There's one explanation here, by the way, because the question came up yesterday at TransLink, where there's an asterisk after the country, it means trips to work. And so it's a little bit incomparable because it turns out that people walk and bike to work less often than they walk or bike, say, for recreation, for exercise, for sports, for visiting friends, and so forth and so on. So it's a little bit incomparable. That's why I wanted to show what the differences are. But still, even just looking at, at the data we've got, all of these over here are for all trip purposes. And the United States for 2009 is also all trip purposes. But the main point is, there are very affluent countries, very high standards of living here in these European countries with much higher levels of walking and cycling. And it's not because they're poor. It's not because they're developing countries. It's not because they can't afford to uh, walk, to drive a car. It's because they choose, because the conditions are so much safer, so much more pleasant and convenient uh, to, to walk and cycle than, than they are in, in, say, North America by comparison. Uh, something that should uh, bring joy to Canadians' heart <laughs> is uh, that there's more cycling in Canadian cities um, than there is in uh, American cities. And this is actually a map I uh, uh, Mark here created this map in the front. Great map. <laughs> I remember when, when Gord Fry saw this, he said, oh, when you want to see high levels of cycling, look up. Look way up. <laughs> and you see uh, the Yukon, the Northern Territories, have the highest levels of, in terms of a mode share. I think the reason is you have very compact, small settlements there with relatively short trip distances that are fairly easy to cover by bike. Uh, but you, the, what I wanted to point out is this, this is all from census data, so it's all trips to work, so it's comparable in that sense, and it's all roughly from the same year, 2006, 2007, and yet you see humongous, really tremendous variations in levels of cycling to work, with the lowest levels here in the southeastern part of the United States and south central part of the United States, and actually the highest levels in the northwest. I'm not really sure what's wrong with Washington State. Uh, um, I know I'm with this group from Seattle, but I always scratch my head and I say, what's wrong with Washington? Why is it it's, it's sort of squeezed in there by, a, it's, uh, it has less than half of the bike mode share of British Columbia and Oregon. So. Um, uh, I don't know what it is, but we're, we'll change it. We're going to change it. We're, we're going we're gonna to increase it, that's for sure. Uh, but the, one of the other points is having a cold climate doesn't necessarily deter cycling. Here you have, I mean, in general, Canada has a colder climate than most of the United States, so it isn't necessarily the colder climate, but it is one of the reasons that Canadian cities have more cycling is you tend to be more compact. There's a number of studies that have documented a higher density of Canadian cities, both the cities and the suburbs, and that the census shows that the median trip distance to work from home is about half uh, in Canada was it is, what it is in the United States. That obviously then facilitates uh, cycling as well. Um, um, good news, sort of a feel-good slide uh, for those of you here from Vancouver, um, that Vancouver actually does very well when it comes to walking and cycling. This slide actually uh, came from Dale, who, who let me borrow this, but you can see here that uh, Vancouver has really, the, it, when you look at both walking and cycling, has the highest level of walking and cycling of any of these major North American cities. So, I mean, that's, uh, I think, a real accomplishment, having both high levels of walking and very high levels of cycling, uh, and then in com combination with of 44% when you include public transit. I mean, when I, when I saw that slide that, that Dale showed, I was thinking, wow, you're becoming Zurich. <laughs> Wow! With re I mean, there aren't very, let me tell you, there aren't many cities around the world that are showing a really de sharp decline in levels of uh, motor vehicle use as a mode share. Um, so, I mean, that was, re I thought, really uh, impressive. And this is the slide that Jory uh, saw. I remember you didn't. But anyway, the, the, you have the major increase here. Dale also uh, loaned me this slide. The major increase here is in cycling, more than any of the modes. You have 41% uh, increase in, in cycling, 19% in walking, and 15% in uh, public transportation. So the, what the Europeans call the green modes, or the environmentally friendly modes of transportation, really, really increasing tremendously, while you have a very tiny increase in motor vehicle use. And so as a result, you get this very favorable shift in mode share. Um, this you've already seen, so I'm not going to, I'm going to skip through those and just note that I think there's a lot of room for further progress. 
because there are many, many trips in both Canadian and American cities that are short enough to make by walking and cycling. Uh, trips in Canadian cities are considerably shorter than they are in American cities. So even in our infamously sprawled, low-density, car-oriented American metropolitan areas, we have over a quarter of all trips are a mile or shorter. And 41% of all trips are two miles or shorter. And this is from the 2009 National Household Travel Survey, which is our national travel survey. It's the latest one. Um, and for sure, those percentages are higher in Canada because can Canadian cities have, are, tend to be more compact and have even higher percentages of short trips. So you have even more potential for increasing cycling than we have in the United States. So that's a pretty high percentage uh, of trips. And a, 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 Two-mile trip is nothing when it comes to bicycling. You can do this, you, you, you bat your eye, and you already have covered two miles practically. So a lot of potential. And if you look at European cities, say Germany, Denmark, the Netherlands, compare that to the United States. We couldn't get data for Canada because Canada doesn't have a national travel survey, unfortunately. Um, but this includes all trip purposes. And it's saying even when you control for trip distance, that many, many of you might think, oh, well, the reason they, they walk and, and bike so much in European cities is they're just so much more compact and they have such short trip distances. Okay, let's get rid of that factor. We're going to control for trip distance and just look within each trip distance category what percentage trips are made by walking and cycling. And if you look at that, this is what we did, you'll see that even when you could look within each trip distance category, the Germans, the Danes, and the Dutch make much, much, much higher levels of walk and bike trips than Americans do. And the difference is especially pronounced at these sort of medium and somewhat longer ranges of say two point, I'm, it's weird why we chose these intervals, but 2.5 to 4.5 kilometers and then 4.5 to um, uh, what is it, 6.5 kilometers. We had to convert from miles to kilometers and so forth um, to make these surveys comparable. But it just shows that there really is huge potential uh, to increase, that we have short enough trips, even in American cities, even more so in Canadian cities, to tremendously increase levels of walking and cycling. The other issue with which uh, Dale pointed out is the, and everyone, actually all, all of the speakers pointed out, and that is the, the gender gap in cycling. That if you look at the percentage of total bike trips made by women uh, as opposed to men, that in, the, in Northern Europe there's, there's virtually no dis difference. In fact, if you look at Denmark and the Netherlands, the majority of bike trips are made by women. Uh, and so it's but roughly 50-50, I would say. If you look at the Netherlands, look at Belgium, look at Scandinavia, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, it's a 50-50. There's really no gender difference when it comes to cycling. If you look at North America, look at Australia, uh, and look at the UK, all English-speaking countries must have something to do with that. <laughs> um, that we tend to have much, much lower levels of women cycling. Um, and that's something we need to really uh, do something about. And the reason is, there's actually a chapter in this book, it's the most important chapter in the book. <laughs> it's really racy, let me tell you. <laughs> it's about women in cycling. And I didn't write it, <laughs> three women colleagues, actually I think they're the leading uh, experts on this topic of uh, women and cycling. It's Jan Gerard, who's a public health professor in Melbourne, uh, Jennifer Dill, who's a, an urban planning professor at Portland State University, and uh, Susan Handy, who's a professor of urban planning and environmental science at University of California, Davis. Anyway, uh, they wrote this chapter and they came to the conclusion that the success, the real success of a bicycling policy and infrastructure as well, the kind of programs you have, the infrastructure that you're providing, the whole package of policies that you're providing can be measured. The success of that on the basis of the percentage of bicyclists who are women. And in fact, Jan Gerard came up with the, in the, the term indicator species. And basically the conclusion is, in this chapter, um, what men need to do is listen to women and do what they tell them they want. <laughs> Um, because as it turns out, 
the, the, in those countries where you have, where you get rid of this gender gap, where you have as many women cycling as men, you have high overall levels of cycling. You also have high levels of children cycling and high levels of senior cycling, and you have all levels of ability. And so it's not the, the game, the aim is not just to get women cycling, but that it's a convenient indicator of how comfortable, how safe, how convenient is your cycling network. Um, and if you have a 50-50 mix, it means you have really achieved success in producing a comfortable, safe, convenient cycling network. Um, and they show this in, in many, many, many different ways. Uh, and how do you get women cycling? We'll get to this a little bit later. But what they found was in all of their surveys, they were both, they're called revealed preference and stated preference service surveys, but they look at what women did. Uh, and observed what kinds of facilities that women prefer to use on the basis of what they actually did. And they also did the so-called stated preference survey. They asked women, what do you want? And in every single case, no matter what survey they did, women wanted physically separated facilities. They did not want to be cycling in heavy mixed traffic on arterials. And, but they didn't want to be cycling on isolated paths through the parks either, because they, there was a criminal sort of a safety element, at least in the United States, in terms of being a woman and cycling alone on some isolated bike path through a park. But they really, 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 above all, uh, preferred having cycle tracks or physically separated from motor vehicle traffic, and the more separation, the better it was. And so, there was one, anyway, one of the conclusions, uh, not, it's not the only way to get women cycling, but it was one uh, possibility. This is a photo actually taken by Susan Handy. They might have shown it last time, five years ago. Um, but this is what you see in, in Copenhagen, Denmark. And I know you people in British Columbia don't like the fact that Danes don't wear bike helmets, but they just don't. <laughs> um, but this is a typical scene in Copenhagen, Denmark. You see mostly women cycling. Um, and. Uh, they're not at least been intimidated by that pink Mercedes <laughs> in back of them. <laughs> Which, I mean, wouldn't you rather be on a bike than at a pink Mercedes? Of course. <laughs> Why not? By the way, that's, uh, that particular bike uh, uh, cycle track there uh, carries over 60,000 bike trips a day. I mean, it's a very, very heavily used uh, bike route. Um, the other issue we have here I think is really important when it comes to walking and cycling, and that's age. Uh, I have gray hair. <laughs> and you're going to get gray hair too, <laughs> whether you want it or not. Well, you're all going to get older, we hope. Uh, I'm certainly getting older. And as I get older, I want to maintain my mobility. I want to maintain my independence. And I want to have physical activity. I want to be able to get out there and see people. And I don't want to be dependent on friends and family and some dial ride paratransit service where I have maybe once a week they'll pick me up and take me somewhere. I want to be able to walk and bike on my own. And the incredible thing is, the hopeful, the wonderful thing is, it is possible. And the notion that somehow as we get older, that we're less and less able to walk or bike, I mean, it's just not really true. I mean, as, if you look at these statistics, in fact, for Germany, Denmark, and the Netherlands, what you find is as the Germans, the Danes, and the Dutch get older and older, they actually make a higher and higher percentage of their trips by biking or walking. Now, they make fewer trips per day as they're getting older and older, but they're making a higher and higher percentage of their trips by walking or biking. To me, what is really amazing, I mean, at least from an American perspective, is if you told an American, do you think it's possible that people over 65 can make a quarter of their trips by bike? They say, oh, no way. But that's exactly what this is. Look at this. In the Netherlands, it's 23% of all trips by those who are 65 and older are by bike. And look at Denmark, 70 to 84. I mean, that's an even higher age category. From 70 to 84 of that age group, they make 15% of their trips by bike and another 21% by walking. So the point simply is that it is not, thank goodness, it is not intrinsically the case. It is not true that as we get older, we're less and less able to walk and bike. In fact, sometimes there are certain conditions that come with aging. You, most of you wouldn't, might not know about it, but I know I have arthritis in my knees and so forth, and it's easier for me, actually, to get around by bike sometimes than it is by walking. 
And this is true for, I think, many people. So it's not necessarily the case that as we get older, cycling is more difficult than the walking. Uh, it's just that you're not in the habit of doing it. But I think the main reason that you have uh, this sort of a different pattern, that you have many, many more, much more walking and cycling among seniors in, in Germany, Denmark, and the Netherlands, is they're provided with safe, convenient uh, facilities. And, uh, that's really important. And I think cycling ought to be for all ages and indeed all abilities. So we really need to make cycling that's possible uh, and safe and convenient and make it feel comfortable for everyone. And I really do think these cycle tracks, I had so much fun, I can't tell you, cycling on these things. Um, cycling safety is absolutely crucial. And the good news here is you can make cycling and walking very, very, very safe. Um, so let's look at it that way instead of the other way that it's so dangerous in the United States. But just look at that, that in the Netherlands and Denmark, they've managed to make cycling about 10 times safer than it is in the United States, 10 times. Was it always that way? No. No, it wasn't. I mean, it's, it's, it's this, this, this common misperception that, oh, it was all, the, there was always a sort of a cycling walking paradise in Europe. Not true. In the 1950s, 1960s, it was very dangerous to walk and cycle in Europe. They implemented that year after year, starting in the 1970s, year after year, all sorts of policies to make walking and cycling safer, to slow down cars, to keep cars out of residential areas and so forth and so on, the traffic calming issues. Look at what this is shows. There was a, what was it, a 60 to 70 to 80 percent decline, depending on this, which country you're looking at, in these European countries, uh, 60 to 80 percent decline in cyclist fatalities uh, in these four European countries. By comparison, in the United States, very, very, very little decline at all. Mind you, by the way, this is at the same time at least in terms of Germany, Denmark, and I said they were having a bike boom. So it's not that they, it's not just that they had a decline in the number of cyclist fatalities, but at the same time, a big increase in number of bike trips. So cycling safety increased even more dramatically than this particular chart is showing. Same thing true with pedestrian safety. Uh, it declined, uh, the, rather it improved, the number of uh, pedestrian fatalities declined in the United States because fewer and fewer people are cycling, uh, walking rather, especially kids no longer walk to school. That's sort of the biggest decline. Uh, and also when it comes to cycling, there's very, very few kids who cycle uh, to school, unfortunately, in the United States. Uh, but again, here um, you can see a, a vast, vast, vast improvement in pedestrian safety in these uh, European countries. Uh, this, again, uh, I th this is compliments of the city of Vancouver and, and Dale uh, Bracewell here, but again, Vancouver is among the safest cities uh, for walking, and it's also among the safest cities in North America for cycling. So let's hear it for Vancouver. <laughs> I mean, and may maybe that's why Vancouver has, of the major North American cities, the highest level of, of walking and biking. I mean, maybe that's why. Um, well, I've already mentioned this point in a sense, but it's really not true that policies in Europe were always so pro-bike, pro-walk. There was a huge turnaround. In the 1950s, 1960s, many, many, in fact, most European countries made, the Western European countries made the huge mistake of trying to copy the United States. Uh, building more and more motorways and widening roads and building parking lots and, and letting cars basically take over their cities. Uh, the beginning of the 1970s was the huge turnaround in this, where they, whoo, wait a minute. What they saw was a huge increase in traffic fatalities, big traffic jams, lots of air pollution, increases in energy use, and so forth and so on. The usual negative things that, that come with excessive car use. And they said, there's this ruining our cities. I mean, our people are being killed, and it's ruining our, our cities, and we can't let this go on. And there was this tremendous turnaround, a political turnaround in public policies, so that since the 1970s, uh, German, Dutch, Belgian, Danish, almost all Scandinavian cities, Austrian, Swiss, and so forth, have promoted walking, cycling, and public transit as an integrated package, really complementary package, integrated with each other, of alternatives to the private automobile. So at the, sa and the same time that they're promoting walking, cycling, and public transit, restricting car use in many ways, including a gasoline tax is about three times or four times higher than it is uh, in North America. 
Uh, just to illustrate this, this is a bridge in Freiburg um, uh, before these reforms, so it's like 1960s or so, and this is the same bridge. This might be the Lions Gate Bridge. <laughs> it can be done here too. I want that's what I want. Next time I come to Vancouver, I want to see the Lions Gate Bridge for pedestrians and cyclists only. <laughs> I mean, let's have that as a goal. I'd love to see that. Uh, one other huge innovation. This is something that's happening here in Vancouver, too. And that's, uh, they, it's called something different. But it's basically traffic calming. Uh, I mean, this is the sort of a street that you would call here maybe a, a local, uh, local street bikeway. Because it, it slows down traffic. You can see what they did to the left. It's the same street, exact same street before and after. To the left, you can see it's definitely, I mean, the cars are parked on the sidewalk. There's no place to walk even. The street is ugly. <laughs> there's, no, there's no sort of street level. There's no sort of human scale lighting. It's just an awful, awful sort of a situation. It certainly doesn't invite you to walk or to bike in that particular environment. To the right, same exact street. And they've done this with about 90% of the streets, by the way, in Freiburg, maybe even more than that. They narrowed the street. They've, they've put in all sorts of shrubbery. They have human scale lighting. They have bike parking. They have benches to sit down and so forth. Uh, so they've really, really, through this traffic calming, they've slowed down the traffic. They also, by law, uh, it's 30 kilometers or less. In many neighborhoods, it's down to seven kilometers per hour. Um, and they make it a perfect place then to walk or to cycle or for kids to play in the street. Another example of this dramatic change is the market, uh, actually it's the Cathedral Square in, in Freiburg in Germany, southwest Germany. Uh, the before one, this was just a parking lot. <laughs> this is the exact same plaza. It was a parking lot. Uh, well, they decided that's not a great use of really important public space, and they turned it instead into a very, very well-used uh, daily uh, public market, really, really nice. So just another way to illustrate, I mean, I've sort of showed in shown in pictures how the policies have changed. But I wanted to show you in terms of the numbers and these graphics, uh, the results of this change in policy. If you look at these, say, German cities, um, and then also the last two cities, Amsterdam and Copenhagen, you can see there's, there was actually a big increase over this period from the 70s to the 80s, 90s, 2000s, and so forth. But I mean, these are big cities. Look, if you look at Berlin, you have a doubling the bike mode share. If you look at Cologne, you have a doubling. Munich, uh, again, one of the biggest of the cities in Germany, more than a doubling, and Nuremberg a, a tripling. Now this is, I would like to see what happened to Nuremberg. I mean, you currently have about a 4% bike mode share here in, um, in Vancouver, I, and I would like to see it, same thing happen uh, as happened in Nuremberg, get at least to 12%, and hopefully higher um, by bike. But anyway, I mean, it really was done. And you can see that, that bicycling really, really did rebound. It, it, it wasn't always the case. It was always at a very high level. We have a doubling, tripling, quadrupling in levels of cycling in these particular cities where there had been a decline previously. Likewise, I just want to point out Amsterdam and Copenhagen. Uh, they really tremendously, over the past 30 or 40 years, have vastly improved their facilities for walking and for biking, but especially for biking. Um, and so going from 25% to 37% or 25% to 38% is a big accomplishment. That's a huge increase in bike mode share. Uh, and so even for those two cities that we assume were always so bike, you know, such bike paradises, it's just not true. They really, really made themselves much more bike friendly than they were before. Take some cities that don't have, never had a tradition really of a lot of cycling, London, Barcelona, Paris, Bogota, Sevilla, Spain. And what you see here is through undertaking a whole package of policies to promote cycling, it is possible, even in a city without a tradition of cycling, to vastly increase levels of cycling. You see in London, more than a doubling. In Barcelona, it's, a, it's like almost a fourfold increase. In Paris, it's more than a doubling, almost a tripling. In Bogota, whatever. And look at Sevilla, Spain is maybe the most uh, impressive. Over a period of only five years, they had more than a 10-fold increase in the mode share uh, for bicycling. And there's, there had been no tradition whatsoever of cycling in Sevilla. Uh, and how did they do it? They put in cycle tracks. They put in over 100 kilometers of cycle tracks over a period of something like three or four years. Um, I don't like the particular design, I must say, of this barrier. <laughs> Uh, I would be afraid that the, the handlebar of the bike could get caught in there. I think the design here in Vancouver is far superior. <laughs> so build 100 kilometers of these things, 
but don't use that particular berry, I would suggest. <laughs> I like those, those flower pots and so forth that you have out there. But anyway, the point is, this physical separation made all the difference in the world. And it also vastly increased the percentage of women uh, who were riding bikes. Well, the other uh, good news is if you look at cities big cities, large, very large cities uh, here within the United States and in Canada, that in, in all of these cities there have been very, very big increases in, in cycling in terms of the bike mode share to work. Um, you see here, and even in the case, well, New York is the one that always claims to be the best and the biggest and the whatever. Um, and they actually have the lowest of the bike mode shares, <laughs> but they still tripled. I mean, it's, it's a, and they're going to do more. I think with the city bike coming on board, coming online now, it's going to do much, much better than it uh, ever has uh, before. But even in New York, you have a tripling. You have uh, in Chicago a quintupling, a five fold increase in cycling in Chicago. Uh, look at Portland. And this is, by the way, this figure is not going to be the same as you'll see in some other statistics because we exclude the work at home trips. Uh, this is from the census. Uh, and so then the percentage of just trips that are actually where you're leaving the house to, to travel and having to travel, it's 6.8% of those trips uh, are by bike in, in Portland. So that's almost a sevenfold increase uh, in Portland. So really tremendous uh, progress here in North America. And in a place where we thought back in the 1990s, oh, you know, this is just bicycling isn't for North America. We've managed to tremendously increase uh, levels of cycling here. So that's progress. It's good news. It's saying we have made a lot of progress. And looking back at the previous slide, there's yet further progress to make because so many of our trips are short enough to make by walking and cycling. So it's a matter of providing that infrastructure, the programs, providing an integrated network of facilities for people to ride their bikes on. Well, there's no one silver bullet. There's no one solution that's going to be successful in making cycling and walking safe and convenient and feasible for everybody. It's a lot of different policies. The, the no-brainer is obviously you have to have the right infrastructure. It might just be a regular street. It might be a street with a bike lane, a buffered bike lane, a, a cycle track. Uh, but there have to be these facilities, safe, convenient facilities. If it's a very, very lightly traveled street with very low speeds and, and no car, no um, uh, large vehicles coming through, maybe you don't need any sort of special facility. Uh, but in any way, you have to provide, consider uh, the range of facilities that are appropriate for different situations. Another thing uh, that's important is integrating walking with uh, and biking with public transportation, especially here. This really struck me yesterday. I had to go out to the um, uh, TransLink headquarters, which is like in the middle of nowhere. Well, not in the middle of it's way out there. <laughs> It's like a 30 or 40 minute ride on the SkyTrain. It is way out there. But even way out there, wow, is there some transit oriented community development? Wow. I mean, I was amazed at the, I mean, it's, but the point is, you, you have this now really expanding transit network. And I think that's really crucial to then use cycling as one of the feeder modes to increase the catchment areas of these various transit stations. It's good for cycling and it's good for transit. It's a lot cheaper to get people to a transit station by bike than it is by a feeder bus and certainly a lot cheaper than having park and ride lots. So I really, really think integration of walking and bicycling with transit is crucial to all this. Traffic calming, I'll get to this in just a second, but I think it's absolutely crucial. It's one of the most neglected policies, not, at, not in Vancouver. Vancouver is actually at the vanguard when, of when it comes to traffic calming in North America. But I would say in most North American cities, especially in American cities south of the border, um, that we do a terrible job. There's just so little done in the way of traffic calming. I mean, maybe a few speed bumps here or a speed hump there, but really nothing comprehensive. Vancouver really has done a much, much better job, I think, than any city, really, uh, any other city in North America. Uh, but I think it's crucial. Uh, traffic calming residential streets, uh, that's most of the streets you've got anyway. And it makes most of those streets then, in any sense, in, in, in effect, they make them local, well, which, what you call local, uh, um, Local street bikeways, that's what it makes them into. People call them different things, bike boulevards and so forth. Mixed use zoning, I, I can't get into all of these things. I think the most difficult thing for us to do in any North American city is restrictions on motor vehicle use. Um, as we found out in Toronto. <laughs> What was that phrase he used? The end to the war on cars or something like that, the, the mayor Ford. Um, and it's in, the, in, in American cities, it's even more difficult, I can tell you. I mean, you propose raising the gasoline tax, reduce parking, you do this. It, it's a struggle. But it's one of the key reasons, I think, that 
walking and cycling and transit levels as well in Europe are higher than they are in the United States. If you're paying three times uh, as much for a gallon of gasoline, uh, if you're paying in Denmark, you pay 168% sales tax when you buy a new car. <laughs> Uh, that might deter you from buying a new car. Um, but there's many, many restrictions. I mean, the, including traffic calming itself is, is, in a sense, a speed restriction. and redu It makes it more difficult, more circuitous to drive your car through the neighborhood. Um, but I think it's absolutely key, and it's, it's one, uh, one of the most difficult challenges that we have, I think, uh, here in North America. Traffic education and safe routes to school also absolutely key. I think both education for for motorists and education for, for kids in school in terms of safe walking and bicycling. And I think traffic regulations, and of course, I'll get to this all in just a second. Uh, ooh, <laughs> I better get going. <laughs> okay, the car-free zones. I think uh, we, there aren't too many of them uh, in, in North America. Uh, they're very, very, very common in European cities. And the, the center of almost every European city, to some extent, is car-free. And it's not just one street. It's a whole, sort of an integrated network of car-free streets, or at least car-limited access uh, to those streets. Uh, this is the example in Münster, Germany. Um, one of the first ones, actually, was here in, uh, in Copenhagen, uh, the Strugget. Uh, and you can see a lot, a lot of people then using it. This is right here in Canada. Not right here in Canada, but over there in Canada. <laughs> it's in Quebec City. As you can see from the signs, it is not uh, English-speaking uh, Canada, but it is. Uh, uh, this used to be a, 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 a narrow road, a narrow street that was that was for cars. Ridiculous. I mean, why do you need cars there? And you can see it's extremely well used. The shops have thrived, which, by the way, is another really important thing. I had to give. <laughs> it's a little bit of, of a digression, but it's important. Um, in April, I had to give a series of five talks in Texas. And if you think it's difficult having restrictions on cars here, <laughs> try it in Texas. I had to give a talk to the Texas State Legislature. And the people at Bike Sex said, whatever you do, don't take away our pickup trucks. <laughs> don't propose an increase in the gas tax. And don't take away our guns. <laughs> I said, oh. <laughs> But tell us that cycling and walking are really good for the economy. And so I looked everywhere. And there's, there really are dozens and dozens of studies that show, without any question whatsoever, that cycling and walking, that investments in walking and cycling facilities and programs bring back benefits that are many times what their costs are. So I think it's really important to make that argument, by the way. And that's the case. And they've done these studies, for example, in New York City. And along those streets, the avenues that have the cycle tracks, the retail sales and the retail sales tax revenues have increased much, much more than on other avenues that don't have the cycle tracks. So that really makes a difference. Another form of a car-free sort of a, an environment is a pedestrian mall. Some have been successful. Some haven't been successful. but so, but anyway, I'm not suggesting you in away with them, but it is one form of a car-free environment that encourages walking. Uh, one of the most common car-free environments, this was the view uh, outside, or is, uh, outside my office. This, uh, I'm on sabbatical at the University of North Carolina uh, this, this past spring semester. Um, and this was my view out of the window. Uh, this was in February. <laughs> it was about 70 degrees, by the way. Uh, <laughs> But I mean, college campuses are, are sort of an example of, you know, this is a really nice environment. Why can't we sort of duplicate college campuses and make, make a lot of our cities like college campuses are, where you have a, a very nice car-free environment for walking? I don't think there's any pedestrian fatalities uh, or cyclists. You don't see any cyclists here, but I know I've cycled there. Uh, it's, it's a very convenient environment. Cycling's perfect for getting around college campuses. I was stunned when I went. This was uh, in last October. I was in Santa Barbara. This is at the University of California. Santa Barbara, and I mean to tell you, they have some fantastic cycling facilities. And just look at all those people cycling. <laughs> I mean, is there any better way to get to class? Um, this is an example in downtown Santa Barbara where they just closed off a street and they decided, we don't want cars there. We're going to make it for pedestrians instead. It's, it really raises the question of who owns the streets? Who owns the roads? Who has the right to use this rare, this, this scarce public space? Do you think that this really scares Valuable public space should be devoted to motor vehicles or to human beings, to people. And I think people ought to have priority over motor vehicles. And I think more and more and more uh, planners and engineers are, are reaching that conclusion as well. But anyway, this is just an example in Santa Barbara where they simply closed off the street and they made it, okay, we're going to make it for pedestrians. And yes, you can even do it in New York. <laughs> I mean, who would have thought this was possible 20 years ago? No one. 
Okay, making Broadway car free from Herald Square up to Times Square and a little bit uh, further north of that. Um, I mean, it's incredible. The, the, how it was done, they started off as an experiment. And you have to be very careful. So I said, well, if it doesn't work, well, you know, get away with it. So we'll do away with it and we'll make it temporary. Well, it was a fantastic success. Now it's permanent. Um, so another thing, you know, making even, even that's probably the most expensive real estate in all of Manhattan and making that into a, a pedestrian zone. It really was very, as you can see, very successful. The High Line was this deserted uh, elevated freight line. It's become a huge tourist attraction. But uh, I'm not a big fan of economics, but uh, I, don't, I don't think that, that the mode we choose should be based just on profits and the, the benefits to businesses. But if you have to get businesses on board, there's the argument to do it. <laughs> and that is when they, when they built this high line or converted it into this pedestrian walkway, the businesses, the whole neighborhoods on both sides flourished. I mean, there are cafes and restaurants and bars and, and lots of new uh, uh, housing. It's been a real boom for business uh, in terms of uh, generating retail sales and generating a new development in this whole area. So it really does have that economic benefit. And getting back to, to walking here, uh, or wherever we were not walking, but crosswalks are crucial. The top one is an example in New Brunswick, New Jersey. <laughs> and that sign at the top, uh, uh, which does conform to, I think, the uniform uh, vehicle code or whatever they call it, the, the uniform whatever it is code, signage code, um, is always sort of flattened <laughs> because the cars just go right over it. <laughs> <laughs> they just don't stop. It's, a, it's too wide. It's much too long of a crossing. There should be a median island there, sort of a refuge island for people who need more time to cross that street. It's very, and it's more difficult then to start looking in both directions to make sure you know, no one's coming from either direction. It's just safer having a shorter crossing. And the bottom crossing is obviously better. You have, a, you have signage to stop. You have better markings on the, uh, on the pavement and so forth. And uh, it's just a much, much better sort of a crossing. This is an example from Seattle. Uh, Bob uh, Edmison uh, loaded me this photo. I'm, I'm thinking, I hope there are any such, aren't any such cases in Vancouver. Does anyone know of a sidewalk that looks like that in Vancouver? <laughs> I hope not. I mean, look at how dangerous that is. How could such a sidewalk exist? <laughs> I mean, you're, you're, if you can't even see. You sort of have to peek around the corner. Is there a car that's going to come and <laughs> run me over? It's like, how did they get away with this? It's unbelievable. <laughs> Anyway, so watch out if you're on that street in, in Seattle. Um, well, complete streets is this big movement in the United States, and I'm not sure if they, they call it in Canada, but I think it's important to provide good pedestrian facilities. And when you're doing any sort of a, a retrofitting of a street or redesigning of a street or repaving of the street, to consider this, make it a complete street, provide facilities for cyclists, for, for cars, but also for, uh, for pedestrians. This is the, at least in the United States, our usual form of facility for walking and cycling is this sort of a mixed use path. This happens to be actually the second most popular recreational uh, path in the United States. It's just north of Boston, it's the Minuteman Trail. If, as long as the volume isn't too high, these sorts of mixed use paths work out okay. But when you get a much higher volume of walking and or cycling, you really get some pretty serious conflicts between the cyclists and the pedestrians because there's just different speeds, different operating characteristics. So you can try to share the space if it tends to be a lower volume and slower speeds, but I think the better solution, and it certainly is in Germany, Denmark, um, and also especially in the Netherlands, is the separation of cyclists from pedestrians when possible. And you can see this is a, um, um, a bikeway in Münster, Germany, where I lived for two and a half years. And in fact, the bike I rode on is just to the left there. <laughs> uh, but they have separate walkways to the right, and then they have this uh, bicycle, they call it a bicycle expressway, which actually encircles the entire city. This is not a recreational path. There are 10,000 bike trips a day on this particular bicycle expressway, and it's a connector. It's sort of like a, a belt line would be for, or whatever you want to call it, a, a circumferential kind of a, a car route, but it's for bikes and it connects dozens of different bicycling facilities coming from outside the city to a number of different bicycling facilities going into the very center of the city. So, but anyway, this is principle of separation. Same thing, and this was in, in Quebec City. i would forgotten now the name of this river, but anyway, they, it was just recent, like a year or two ago, they, they finished this. But again, you can see their principle here is that sort of a separation. So it makes it more comfortable for the cyclist, it makes it more comfortable also for the pedestrian. 
Uh, Montreal, in all of North America, as far as I know, has the most uh, cycle tracks. They have over 100 kilometers of two-way cycle tracks. Um, I, I must tell you, though, I, I like the, the barriers here in, in, uh, in Vancouver better than the ones in Montreal. I mean, Montreal is great. I, mean, I really, really enjoyed uh, cycling in Montreal, but these, the, I just think that the kinds of barriers you have here on the cycle track on Hornby Street and Dunsmuir and so forth, I think they're even more attractive with the flowers and so forth. You can make it more attractive than just the bollards, but maybe this is less expensive, I don't know. Uh, one thing that I thought was really amazing, a friend of mine who was the bike planner for Sydney, Australia, Fiona Campbell, uh, was at first an activist. Um, for all the time I was living in Australia. And then she became the official bike planner for the city of Sydney. And she really wanted to get more women on bikes. And I said, I want you to get more women on bikes too. <laughs> so she built this whole network, I mean, of, of physically separated cycle tracks in Sydney, Australia, over a period of three years. And they more than doubled the number of bike trips in three years. So it was really, really, really successful. That's a really, really nice looking cycle track, uh, ask me. Now, I'm not a fan of Walmart. <laughs> so this is not advertising for Walmart, believe me. But just to show you that even in a place like Arkansas, even a firm such as Walmart <laughs> is willing to build a cycle track like this. I mean, if you can convince Walmart to build a cycle track, maybe you convince cycle tracks to be sponsored by other sorts of, uh, of firms, of banks. Actually, if you look at London, England, uh, Barclays sponsors the cycling superhighways in London. Uh, I think it's, a, if I'm not mistaken, there are sort of financial issues here in the Metro Vancouver area, as in almost every city uh, in North America. You don't have unlimited funds, and why not have the business community contribute somewhat? Get them a little advertising. Let them say sponsored by TD or sponsored by whatever bank you know you're interested in, and you know it gives them publicity and it also helps finance those sorts of facilities. Uh, these are some examples of bike lanes in uh, uh, Seattle. So if you come to Seattle, uh, come back with our group. <laughs> this is what you'll see. Um, but they're, they're actually planning on building, I think there's three, is it three cycle tracks that are on? The, how many? Who, who can, does anyone know for sure? Anyway, it's, it's something like three uh, cycle tracks that are in the plans just about to be started up now in, in Seattle. Um, the other thing you can do if you can't build a cycle track, you have a buffered bike lane, which at least gives you some protection, not a physical barrier, but at least it gives you a little bit more space. Um, another issue is that the intersection is probably the most challenging thing to deal with when you're talking about bicycle facilities, because you want to make sure that turning motorists, left turning or right turning motorists, don't run into a, a cyclist or a pedestrian. And so you have to have special facilities, especially for the cyclists. You could have an advanced stop line. Um, I personally take an advanced stop line, whether it's there or not. <laughs> I don't wait for the permission to do it. I just do it. And um, so I'm not sure if you, those of you who are cyclists, maybe you do the same thing. But I, I really think it's important to be in the line of sight of the motorists. And, and if you get a head start, it means you're also halfway through the intersection before the cars are starting anyway. So you can have it with a bike box or without a bike box. The advantage of the bike box is you have a place to wait. More, more, more cyclists can wait there at the front of the intersection. Traffic calming, as I mentioned before, is absolutely crucial. Uh, because it turns out this, this speed limit of 30 kilometers an hour, which is the standard for traffic calming in Europe, is, is crucial. It's not arbitrary. As you can see here, it turns out over 30 kilometers an hour, the probability of getting killed as a pedestrian in a crash with a motor vehicle increases exponentially. And so you really, really, really want to keep the speed limit at residential areas 30 kilometers an hour or, or less. And it doesn't have to be really complicated, expensive traffic calming. I mean, look at this street in Freiburg, Germany. This is a traffic calm street. And do you see hugely expensive infrastructure there? I see two bollards and some paint on the roadway, and that's it. That is not a terribly expensive uh, kind of an infrastructure improvement. But that particular stretch of street, in fact, is called a Spielstrasse. And you can see here a kid kicking a 
probably a soccer ball. <laughs> um, and that, that street is called, Spielstrasse means a play street, and so it's meant for kids to play, for people to walk, people to bike. It's not something just for cars. And you'll see, though, that it ends. These two bollards are sort of the, the extent of this. So they've decided this whole street is actually traffic calmed. But for certain sections of it, they further reduce the speed limit to turn those sections into basically playgrounds for kids. That kids can play on those parts of the streets and so forth. And also make it, makes it more convenient, safer to cross the street and for neighbors to visit each other and so forth. Um, but anyway, this, uh, not, over 90% of the streets in, tra in Freiburg are, are traffic calmed in this way. And by the way, this, the, these neighborhoods with the seven kilometer an hour or less, the Spielstrassen, these are things that are being, it's a grassroots movement. Neighborhoods are asking the city, would you please turn our street into a Spielstrasse? Would you please reduce the speed limit? Because, and, and all the studies show that once you introduce traffic calming, you dramatically reduce traffic fatalities. You dramatically reduce, in particular, uh, pedestrian fatalities and cyclist fatalities, and particular child fatalities. Uh, and so I think that, that really there ought to be a, a public information campaign to parents saying, you know, do you care about your kids? Wouldn't you like them to survive their childhood? I mean, there's the, that if, I mean, I'm serious about this. That, I mean, traffic, it's a matter of priorities. It really, really is what's more important, the car speeding through your neighborhood where it shouldn't be using as a through street anyway, or are your kids more important? Is the quality of life in the neighborhood more important? I mean, it's a matter of the environmental quality, the noise, the safety of the neighborhood, and, and letting kids visit each other, play ball on the streets. I mean, I think that ought to be the priority and not allowing through traffic to, to endanger everyone and, and pollute the air. Uh, oh, anyway, <laughs> never told you the story of this. Uh, <laughs> But it really is. I think it's a matter of priorities. It, you know, everyone, when people say there's not enough funding, I would say baloney. It's a matter of priorities. The, in, in North Carolina, I mean, this is a real true example. The, I, um, they're improving it an intersection uh, of the interstate highway system uh, somewhere or other in North Carolina. It's costing over $2 billion. And the, the head, uh, the ped bike uh, coordinator for the state of North Carolina said that every single bike project, ped bike project in the entire state could be financed with those $2 billion. I mean, it really is a matter. The money is there. But it's, for whatever reason, it gets spent in the wrong ways. This is another example of one of these uh, Spielstrassen, or super traffic calmed streets, or home zones. Uh, this one is Berlin. Something I wanted to show, the reason I wanted to show you this slide is just to show you how extensive this traffic calming is. I mean, Berlin is the biggest of the German cities, 3,800 kilometers. It ends up being 72% of all the streets in Berlin are traffic calmed at 30 kilometers or less. And that really does basically turn them all into, in, in effect, local street bikeways. That's a lot of local street bikeways, 3,800 kilometers. <laughs> um, another uh, trend is toward shared streets. Uh, this is also, I mean, it's, it's also a Spielstrasse, so, because you can see with the sign, but you can see that there's no sidewalk. There's no special facility for walking or for biking. It's simply a shared space. But with th this sign will tell you that a car had better watch out because as a, as a motorist, if you hit a cyclist or a pedestrian in this area, you are in big trouble. And so your car is going very, very slow indeed because if they do hit someone, they're in trouble. Um, and even in the United States, I, I, uh, this uh, was a picture uh, near Harvard Square and they have two of these. Uh, and, and when I was studying actually at MIT, this was not a shared space at all. It was ugly, it was terrible it was cars and trucks, delivery vehicles and so forth. And now it's a shared street. And I, I really, as you can see, being taken over by pedestrians. You do have bicyclists there as well, but it's mainly being used by pedestrians. I think another aspect of traffic calming is you want to make things as circuitous as possible for cars. You don't want them to use neighborhood uh, streets uh, just as a shortcut to get through. Uh, you want to use them, make, let them use major arterials and, and route them around residential neighborhoods. And one way you do this is these sorts of artificial dead ends. Sort of it's a cut through for the bicyclist um, and for the pedestrian, obviously, but it's a dead end for the car. 
These uh, pictures I got just last October when I was in Montreal and Quebec City. So they're using these diverters to, again, that's another way of preventing the through traffic in residential neighborhoods and doesn't cost that much. Um, Vancouver, you, you lead North America with 152 kilometers of, I guess, in combination local street bikeways and uh, neighborhood greenways. Um, let's call them neighborhood greenways. So it's, it's sort of a, people call them different things. But anyway, you lead North America in doing this. It's like what I call this sort of a, a form of traffic calming, but it facilitates in particular cycling because of the placement of stop signs and so forth. So it limits the number of stops uh, for cyclists, uh, which is important. I don't like stopping when I'm a cyclist either, and don't expect me to stop at a stop sign. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, but at any rate, it facilitates the cycling, uh, but deters through traffic in all sorts of ways and slows down traffic. Uh, Seattle now has a big movement. The number of, of uh, people uh, from Seattle with our group are working on greenways in Seattle. And again, I think it's just a great idea. And you know, they, they came up with the term Portland now has also changed its terminology. Uh, they used to use the term bike boulevards. Now they're also calling them neighborhood greenways because many of these improvements are, it's not just for bicyclists. It really is for kids playing in the street, it's for people crossing the street, it's for pedestrians as well as for cyclists. And it really is for the whole neighborhood. Um, it's, it's, it almost, it really does sort of turn that kind of a residential street into almost a little bit of a park. And I think, so it benefits more than just the cyclists. And maybe this redesignation and not calling something a bike boulevard, but instead calling it a neighborhood greenway is a good way in terms of public relations to sort of get this, get more of these built because it's not just for cyclists, it's also for pedestrians. Um, and it turns out, by the way, when you traffic on a neighborhood, it also reduces uh, traffic fatalities among um, motor vehicle occupants. Um, you already saw this slide, but I, I think or maybe you didn't. I don't think. Did you saw this slide? Okay, you get to see it. <laughs> and that is that uh, the biggest increase in cycling facilities uh, in the city of Vancouver has been, in fact, these local street bikeways. Uh, and I think it's absolutely fantastic. I mean, that's a really substantial expansion in cycling facilities uh, since 1992. I didn't do the math, but it looks like there's a five fold increase in uh, cycling facilities uh, since 1992. Uh, really, really very impressive, and you know, congratulations to Vancouver. But the biggest increase clearly is in the local street bikeways, and I think that's a really great way to go. But I must say, I really love that little new blue line coming in at the top. More of those Hornby cycle tracks, please, please, please. <laughs> I mean, I was actually I was cycling with Dale coming here, or to the restaurant, and then also coming here, and it was just. I can't tell you how exhilarating it is. I mean, you're, you're on this bike and, and you're on your own right of way. You can actually cycle side by side unless someone's coming in the other direction. You have these flowers over here. You've got the trees over here. I mean, I was like almost in ecstasy. And not because of Dale. <laughs> I, mean, I was like, uh, it's like, wow. This is really neat. I mean, there's just th this joy to riding a bike when you don't, when you're not stressed out, worrying about the cars being in the way. Um, well, one of the other big fads, I'm not fads, trends, and I think a very positive trend, by the way, in North America is, is bike sharing. And uh, you have over 50, by the end of this uh, 2013, over 50 bike sharing systems in the United States. City Bike just opened like two or three weeks ago. Uh, I lose track, maybe it was a month ago. I anyway, lost track of it. Um, and that's going to have 6,000 bikes. And they deliberately made it 6,000 bikes, so it would be a little bit more than Montreal's 5,000 bikes. <laughs> So they didn't want Canada to claim the largest bike sharing system in North America. No, 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 that had to be New York. <laughs> but anyway, uh, you have bike sharing systems popping up all over the place now. It's probably one of the biggest trends in terms of cycling. But the key here is the convenience, especially for actually bike transit integration. It sort of, it helps solve that last mile problem of getting from your transit stop to the final destination or the reverse, getting from where you're living to where the transit stop is can be very, very convenient in that respect. And that's why, in fact, if you look at, um, I saw a study of the Vélib system in Paris, and it was something like over 80% of the Vélib bike trips are to or from a transit station. So it's really, really an important aspect in terms of transit, uh, uh, bike transit integration. Uh, by the way, I, gotta, uh, I told the people to translate this yesterday, so I got to show you this too. Uh, the woman who's the head of bike planning in Cambridge, Massachusetts. By the way, Cambridge was uh, rated as the number one bicycling city, um, I guess the most bikeable, that's what it was. They had this bikeability index, and it got the number one bikeability um, 
uh, rating for any city in, in the United States at any rate. And she uh, took this picture and she said, John, I want you to show this, this, this slide. And I said, now look really carefully at it. Do you see that poster we're using to advertise our bike sharing program, which is called Hub, by the way? Um, one out of 10,000 historians agree if Napoleon had led his troops into battle on bicycles, he would have won. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, you got to have a little fun, too. <laughs> I thought this was the cover of the New Yorker magazine, uh, June 3rd, and I just thought it was perfect. I mean, just perfect. It captures exactly the insanity of our society. We pay money to bicycle on stationary bikes in really you know, unhealthy air, people sweating and smelling and cooped up indoors for, and, and paying to do this, getting from nowhere to nowhere, um, whereas you can actually bike, you don't have to pay to get this exercise, you're actually getting from point A to point B, you're having fun, you're out in the open air, getting to see people and talk to people. I'm thinking, oh. <laughs> It really, it really is, it's just incredible to me that people will drive their car to the gym and then exercise in the gym. It's, it's just beyond me. Anyway, um, another issue is uh, bike parking. Uh, just, just as biking is, is uh, just as parking is crucial for cars, it's, it's equally crucial uh, for bikes. I mean, are you going to bike somewhere where you can't park it? Where it's going to be stolen when you leave it? No. You want to have good, secure bike parking, if possible, sheltered bike parking. You don't necessarily have a uh, wet bike when you come back either. Uh, well, one of the key uh, developments uh, in, in Portland, all San Francisco, and a number of other cities as well now is bike corrals. And they are extremely popular. The, just as with the case of the traffic colony I was talking about in Germany, where the neighbors actually, the, the neighbors themselves, petitioned the city, would you please traffic calm our street? Well, businesses in San Francisco and Portland, a number of other cities around the country now, I mean, both in Canada and the United States, are in fact petitioning the city, would you please take out that car parking and convert it into bike parking? You know why? Because they can get more customers for the same amount of space. They can get something like 30 times more customers uh, to park their bikes as they could customers coming by car. So it's, and again, if you want to make the case for business, you say oh, it's great for business. It increases retail sales. I must tell you, the first version I had of the slide, when I told, showed it in Texas, before I showed it, the head of Bike Texas said, uh-uh-uh. Because I said, I, what I said is convert car parking to bike parking. He said, oh, no, 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 no. That sounds too auto-restrictive. Texans won't like to hear that. Just say it's good for business. So, okay, it's good for business. <laughs> But it is converting car parking to bike parking. <laughs> and again, it's something that's very popular. And in, in Portland, there's a waiting list of businesses to get bike corrals built and, and have car parking take out. Traffic education, I think, is crucial. I'll try to wrap up as soon as I can. Um, but I think it's even more important for motorists than it is for uh, cyclists. And for I think it's important for everybody, really. I think every kid, and in fact, in the Netherlands, Germany, and Denmark, every kid by the third or fourth grade has extensive traffic safety education because they're kids. It's mainly a matter of safe walking and safe cycling. But I think at least as important is motorist training. And you'll see here, uh, this is actually Ralph uh, Bueller, who's one of my co-authors, friends, and, and been a colleague for a long time, uh, downloaded this from the official test for getting a driver's license in Germany. And you don't see them, but there's sort of multiple choice answers to each of these things. Well, the, the correct answer in every one is yield to the cyclist, yield to the pedestrian, yield to the pedestrian, and so forth. I said, Ralph, what in the world is this thing to the lower right? What, what are you supposed to do? What's that all about? And he said, it is the following. According to German law, and by the way, also Belgian, Danish, Dutch law, um, that it is your responsibility as a motorist, because you're driving the big vehicle that's causing the danger, it is your responsibility to proactively anticipate the possibility of endangering a pedestrian or a cyclist. And the answer, the correct answer to this is you should anticipate the possibility that that kid on that bike might dart out into the road and you must slow down because it, if he did that, you would hit the kid and it would be your fault, the motorist's fault. Um, and in fact, Ralph failed the driver license test 
the, the driving portion of it because he did not demonstrate that he was proactively anticipating the possibility of endangering a, uh, it was either a pedestrian or a cyclist who was on the sidewalk. <laughs> I mean, in the United States, if that were the criteria, no one would have a driver's license. <laughs> I just know one. Um, in terms of traffic safety, education, you know, first they have these test courses. Um, what are they called here in Canada? They're called uh, traffic safety gardens, I think, or something like that. Anyway, there are these traffic safety courses that are sort of fenced off they're to give kids first practice in understanding the signs and the ways to go. And then you go out with a real police officer and you get tested to be sure you can navigate in real traffic. So uh, you, get, you get a certificate, you get like a, because I, yeah, we, uh, we have an exchange program with a German university and I ask every one of our students, I said, does this really happen? <laughs> because I mean, I just, I can't believe it. And they say, yeah. And they get the certificate, they get a pennant, they get put on the wall, they get a sticker for their bike. And one of my German exchange students said he got the highest grade on, on the test, on this uh, cycling safety test. And it was just the proudest moment in his entire life. And I think, wow, this is a big deal. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but it means, what, what, the important thing here is that every girl and every boy, by the time they're in the third or fourth grade, has comprehensive training in safe walking and safe bicycling. And, be, and that's the way then that they get to school. And I think it's really important that every girl and every boy then, that's the way they get to school. They get used to cycling on a daily basis and it's not something unusual that you have to teach them when they're 50 or 60 years old. The other thing you gotta provide is safe cycling facilities to get to those schools. And you can see this is in the Netherlands. There's a, a cycle track that takes you right to where the school is and then you can see how they get to school by bike. Now this, I gotta tell this story. Uh, Fiona Campbell, she's wonderful. She, I wish she were here to, to just tell this story. Um, she was the one who got the cycle track put in. And before the cycle track was put in, she said there was zero kids cycling to school. Not one kid cycled to school. They put in the cycle tracks and now they have a third of kids cycling to school. That is amazing. And believe you me, cycling in Sydney before was not at all easy. And it just shows, I mean, it, you really can make cycling safe for kids and they really can cycle to school, but you have to provide the right facilities. And if you can do it in Sydney, Australia, believe me, you can do it here in Vancouver, that's for sure. This, again, you know, the, I, I mentioned those two big categories of, I think, public information campaigns we need to be promoting. One, the economic benefits of investing in walking and cycling, and second, the health benefits of walking and cycling. I just want you to look at this. Um, they did a study, this was 20,000 school children, 20,000, so it wasn't a small sample, 20,000 school children. They found that, these, that those kids who walked or cycled to school were more attentive, better able to concentrate, now get this, they were advanced in the level of mental alertness by half a school year. And now, hold on to your hats, although I think I'm the only one wearing one. <laughs> they found that the kids got more benefit in terms of their mental development, more benefit than they would have by having breakfast and lunch. Can you imagine that walking and cycling to school is that great? for the learning experience of kids. I mean, not only is, does it have the physical benefits of whatever physical activity they're getting, but also, you know, the mental benefits of advancing them half a school year in mental alertness. It's just, it was incredible. Uh, safe routes to school, of course, is one way uh, you can do it. Uh, sort of having a, one program, getting kids together. I think a kid individually is gonna feel uncomfortable doing this. So getting a group of kids, having maybe uh, having parents take turns, having the, the dad do it or the mom do it and, and sort of take turns on the block for walking the kids to school together. It can be a fun event. It's not sort of a, a, an onerous duty, make it fun. Uh, I think that's what sort of safe routes to school and, and bike to school day and walk to school day can be made into. You gotta provide good crosswalks uh, to do that. Uh, you can have walking school buses. Um, and then you have all sorts of special events that you can hold, such as, uh, for example, this is, summer, this is in summer, uh, Somerville next to Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, these all sorts of cyclovias or open streets, uh, Sunday parkways, car-free days, whatever you wanna call them. This is a, a rather bigger one. This is in Los Angeles. They have over 100,000 participants. And in New York City, um, they have 250,000 participants in the, um, what's it called? 
called Summer Streets, uh, but S-U-M-M-E-R, <laughs> uh, just up and down uh, Park Avenue. So it's quite a way. And these Ciclavias, or open streets programs, uh, the woman who studied this, her name is uh, Olga uh, Sarmienta, uh, sort of the world's experts on Ciclavias, and she's in Bogota, Colombia. But look at this trend. I mean, I was talking about the trend of bike sharing. I mean, look at the trend in the number of cities that have at least two Ciclavia events per year. I mean, that is, that's really an exponential increase. Uh, so that, in fact, uh, this will stun Mark. <laughs> October 6th in New Brunswick, New Jersey, we're going to have our first ever Ciclavia and Gil Penulosa is going to be there. <laughs> I mean, wow! You have no idea what that means to have a Ciclavia in central New Jersey. It's like unimaginable. <laughs> But anyway, it's, it's a really great way to get everyone out there and feel comfortable, have the whole family cycling together. It, it makes it walking and cycling, but especially getting people used to cycling and comfortable cycling and, and, and that it's an everyday normal thing to do. This is, may not be the normal everything day to do. <laughs> <laughs> this was a photo. I'm not, do they have one of these rides in Vancouver as well? I inserted the fig leaves <laughs> because I didn't, any, didn't want anyone to criticize me <laughs> for having an obscene slide. I think I inserted the fig leaves correctly. I'm glad they didn't move around. <laughs> Well, this is the, the so-called summer solstice ride that they have actually, not this coming Saturday, but I think it's is it next Saturday in Seattle. Um, I'm going to be flying back to North Carolina that day. <laughs> but anyway, I mean, Portland actually has the world's largest uh, naked bike ride. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what the attraction is, but you know what? If it's fun <laughs> to ride in it, if it's fun to watch it, do it. <laughs> Whatever it takes if to promote cycling, do it. This is the last slide, I promise. And that is really the most important, in a sense, is how do we get these policies implemented? I've already mentioned a number of these. Uh, publicize the individual and societal benefits. You really, I think we really need to do more in terms of communication. Communicating with media, through the media, uh, to the public, to politicians, but really give them information that they can then also use to, to further this argument. Uh, give politicians that ammunition they need in terms of information, data, statistics, easily understandable, convincing, uh, as simple as possible. And the information really does exist on the economic benefits of, of, of cycling, the, the health benefits of cycling. Uh, and to emphasize, there's, it, it benefits both to the individual as well as society as a whole. I think if you told people, go out there and bike because it's better for the environment, you'll you know, hinder global climate change and so forth. Um, I don't think most people are going to cycle just for that reason. But if you tell them, you know what, for every hour you spend cycling, you're going to add more than an hour to your expected healthy lifetime. It's true, by the way. Uh, you might get someone on a bike. <laughs> Let me just repeat that. For every hour you spend cycling, you add more than an hour to your expected healthy lifetime. Um, and you, you saw these other statistics I, I gave for kids. You know, it's making your kids healthier. It, it helps them learn better. I mean, I think we need to really provide the public with more information to, to inform them about all these range of benefits um, from cycling and from walking. And that even if you don't get on a bike, you're getting these benefits. You're breathing cleaner, cleaner air because your neighbor is bicycling. And the whole tra all the traffic in general is becoming safer because there's more people cycling and so forth and so on. There's energy savings. There's less uh, climate change and so forth and so on. Uh, and less health costs for everybody. And by the way, the issue of health, I mean, it's not just a matter of cycling and walking being healthy. There are humongous health costs out there, hundreds of billions of dollars a year, a year in extra health costs because of people not getting active uh, actively traveling around, not getting the physical activity that they need. Uh, and you could save a lot in the way of, of health costs by getting more people walking and cycling. Well, I don't want to, I'm not going to go through all these points, but I think it's absolutely crucial uh, to build alliances. So I really, I've been working very actively with the transportation branch of the Sierra Club. I work with uh, the, uh, uh, what's it, uh, 
I mean, a AARP, the, the senior group. I work with cycling organizations, walking organizations, transportation people. I mean, as many people as a public health, I think is absolutely crucial. And there's a lot more public health experts than there are transportation experts. I mean, it's a really huge network. Uh, I think we ought to really build alliances, work together for the common goal of increasing walking and cycling for all these range of benefits. We might, each of us, have a different goal in mind. But if we do it, if we achieve these goals by increasing walking and cycling, we can work together. And I think working together, we can achieve more. I also think that political leadership is absolutely crucial. And if you look at cities such as New York City, Chicago, Los Angeles, look at Paris or London, look at Bogota, Colombia, Curitiba, or Brazil, all of them sort of had these cycling booms because of a mayor who was charismatic and who really dedicated uh, to cycling. So I think the convincing politicians, getting politicians on our side and, and helping them by giving them information and supporting them, uh, I think really, really uh, is a crucial sort of a thing. So I think, um, I don't think I want to get through all of these things because uh, the, the also the, in terms of don't expect everything to happen at once. When I say implement controversial policies and stages, but it's more than that, you have to really implement plans for the long run. Don't expect that in one or two years you're going to achieve a complete network of integrated great cycling facilities, it's going to take time. There's a very famous video by Jan Gale of Copenhagen who shows that it took over four decades for Copenhagen to become today what it is. And if you went back 40, 50 years ago, you'd think, oh, what an awful car-oriented city. So it really took a long, many decades, actually. So it's, you have to be in there for the long run, have a consistent policy over time. And little by little, little by little, little by little, the Copenhagen of 50 years ago no longer exists. And now it's very friendly toward walking, cycling, and public transit. Just another plug for the book. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll just say, in concluding, I really think there's so many reasons to promote walking and cycling. We know those reasons. I, mean, I have no doubt that everyone in this room is convinced that it's worth promoting walking and cycling. But it's somehow, we have to get that, that information across to the media and via the media to politicians, to the public at large, so we get the public support we need for the financing of better walking and cycling facilities, but not just the financing. It's also a matter of getting their approval for shifting priorities in terms of space. Who, this whole issue of who owns the roads, who ought to have this space on the road? So it's often very, every city, it's a controversy. We're going to put in a bike lane. We're going to put in a cycle track. Oh, you're going to take away my parking. Oh, it's going to be a lane less of, of, of cars. But it's a matter of priorities. And you have to convince more and more people it's worthwhile devoting that space uh, and the money to building those facilities to encourage more walking and cycling because it really is going to help society at large and each individual member of society. And let me just stop there and you can ask all sorts of questions that I can't answer. <laughs>